Hey Quaker Gap, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. The story we're going to look at this evening begins with Jesus reading scripture in his hometown synagogue, but it ends with a mob threatening to throw him off of a cliff. Must have been some intense Bible verses he read, huh? Uh, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight to be reminded of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done for us. Uh, Lord, remind us of who he is, and Father, of the great difference that he makes in this world. Father, as we gather together tonight, we continue to pray for our nation, and uh, Lord, as we approach the 4th of July weekend, just ask, Lord, for unity. We pray, Father, for peace. Uh, we ask, Father, that the ills of our culture might be mended. Lord, that people would turn to you, toward, toward you for redemption and for revival. And, Father, that uh, your church would lead the way. Heavenly Father, we pray for this COVID-19 crisis and ask, Lord, that uh, you might take charge, Father, that the numbers would begin to drop. Father, that we might see healing, and Lord, that we might be protected from these days. Father, we also want to pray for our congregation, for any who might be feeling ill, for those who are suffering with uh, illness and those who are recovering from surgeries. Lord, we just lift them up to you and pray, Father, for your healing, for your uh, continuous presence in their life. We pray for any who are experiencing any other difficulties, Lord, whether it be due to employment uh, or emotional needs. Father, you know each heart, you know each need, and so, Lord, we lift them up to you and pray, Father, for your mercy and your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and that due to his coming into this world and taking our place on the cross and dying there and then being raised up from the dead, Lord, that we have forgiveness of sin and salvation. So, Lord, tonight as we look at your word together, I pray that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So one Sabbath morning in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, he returns to his home synagogue. And I'm sure there were plenty of family there and some of his boyhood friends and neighbors that were just delighted to see him. He was always such a good boy, a sharp student of the law and the prophets. And word has made it to Nazareth that Jesus is a rabbi of some sort. It isn't a surprise, then, that when he arrives at the synagogue on this Sabbath day, that he is given the honor of reading from the scroll. Jesus takes the scroll. He walks to the center of the room, unrolls to a select passage in the prophet of Isaiah, and he begins to read. Reading now from Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal thyself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. 
All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So he rolls the scroll back up after he's finished reading, and he hands it to the attendant. He takes a seat there in the synagogue. Everyone's watching him, waiting to hear his comments on the passage. And he begins by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, this is his hometown. These people know him well. They know his parents. They know his brothers and sisters. They know the house where he was raised. He played ball with their sons and their daughters. They like Jesus. But what is he saying? You see, Nazareth is not known for prophets and rabbis. It's off the beaten path. Even its residents know that nothing good ever comes from Nazareth. But Jesus says that Isaiah has been fulfilled today. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, we better go back to Isaiah to see what the prophet was talking about. Isaiah chapter 61, where this passage of scripture that Jesus was reading is found. Isaiah chapter 61. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Well, it begins with these words, the Lord has anointed me. Well, who is anointed in the Old Testament? Prophets who spoke for God, priests who served the Lord in his temple, and kings Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed in the Old Testament. To anoint someone was to set them apart by, by pouring oil upon them. And if Jesus claimed to be the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, he claimed that he was anointed by God, a prophet, a priest, a king, or even more significant than that, maybe Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. You know, the Hebrew word for Messiah is Mashiach, and it literally means anointed one. At the least, Jesus was claiming to be a prophet. At most, he claimed to be the Messiah. Isaiah, in his passage, includes a job description here for the anointed one. And it includes a few different elements. It says, first of all, to proclaim the good news. God has anointed me to proclaim the good news. And he says that he's to proclaim the good news to the poor. You know, good news in the Greek language is euangelizo, or evangel, which was later translated by the English word gospel. The anointed one of Isaiah chapter 61 would come to proclaim good news, the gospel, to poor people. Also, it continues, the Lord has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted. So the anointed one of Isaiah chapter 61 would also be there to apply a cast or a bandage for broken hearts. In other words, he was sent to heal the suffering of the people. He continues, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim freedom for the captives and also to proclaim release from darkness for the prisoners. The anointed one of Isaiah chapter 61 would not only proclaim freedom for captives, but secure freedom for the captives. He would set those who are oppressed and in bondage free. He was called to free the hostages. In his reading of Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus adds 
a couple of lines in summary from other places in the prophet Isaiah. He adds to the freedom for hostages a couple more aspects of the job description of the anointed. One of those is the recovery of sight for the blind. And he also adds freedom for those who are oppressed. Recovery of sight for the blind and freedom for the oppressed. If you read Isaiah chapter 58 and 59, you will see that the anointed one will bring light to those walking in darkness. Isaiah predicts that there will be those groping in blindness and that this anointed one will come and free the oppressed and give sight to the blind. Jesus also reads from the scroll in Isaiah 61 to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the anointed one of Isaiah 61 would announce that God's goodness and his favor is about to be unleashed. Right? Jewish readers would understand what this would mean. They would recognize the year of the Lord's favor as the year of Jubilee, the year when refugees are set free and debts are forgiven, the year of new beginnings, the year of fresh starts. The anointed one of Isaiah chapter 61 would proclaim God's fresh start for his people. So let's put all of that together. According to Isaiah, the anointed one will announce good news. He will heal suffering. He will free hostages. He will cure blindness. He will end oppression and he will create fresh starts. So after reading this passage of scripture, without batting an eye, Jesus confidently sits in the midst of his hometown folks, and he says, this is fulfilled today. And so there's this mixed reaction at first. I mean, he's such a nice boy, so well-spoken, but, but then it begins to register with them. He thinks he's some type of prophet isn't this Mary and Joseph's boy? Who, who on earth does he think that he is? He must be out of his mind. Matthew tells us they took offense at him. Now, Jesus knows what they are thinking. Sure, they've heard the rumors about his teaching and his miracles. But this is his hometown. <laughs> He's going to have to show these people. They're not going to believe it. So he looks into their eyes and sees that there is no faith there. So he repeats an old proverb. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Then he compares himself to Elijah and Elisha, some of the greatest prophets of Israel. He says, remember Elijah? You know, though there were many widows among his own people during the time of drought, the Lord sent him to a widow in Zarephath of Sidon, a Gentile widow. And he says, remember Elisha? Though there were many lepers throughout Israel during his day, the Lord sent him to cleanse Naaman, a Syrian. His point being that the Lord sends his anointed one to foreigners when their hometown folks lack faith. And this is when they became angry. See, we know who you are, Jesus. You are a carpenter from Nazareth. Now you want us to believe that you are Elijah? You want us to believe that you are Elisha? You want us to believe that you are anointed? You want us to receive you as the Messiah? You think that you are the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy? Now, it's not that they weren't looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah. The people of Galilee during those days were barely scraping to make ends meet. And then they were overtaxed and overburdened by the Roman government. They were poor. They were oppressed. They were suffering. They were people who badly needed a fresh start. All of the things that Jesus offered to them were things that they desperately needed. It's just that Jesus didn't seem like the one to answer their needs. They were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for a military hero, a political superstar. They were waiting for the clouds to part, for the Lord to come and to rescue them from Rome. Jesus was just too meek, too humble, too ordinary. They wouldn't believe. Matthew tells us 
that Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So the congregation became furious that Sabbath, and they eventually drove Jesus out of the synagogue, out of town. They would have thrown him off of a cliff if he had not walked right through the crowd and disappeared from their view. If only they had known. God in the flesh, the King of Kings, the Anointed One, the Messiah, their only hope for this life and the next was right there under their very noses. But they refused to believe. And in their spiritual blindness, they drove him away. They could have been free. You know, not just from Caesar. I mean, Caesar's nothing. They could have been free from Satan. So what did Jesus offer them that day? And what does Jesus offer us today? Well, he offers the kingdom of God. He gives us the opportunity to switch rulers, to be ruled by God and not be ruled by sin anymore. You may remember that Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But now my kingdom is from another place. The kingdom of God, you see, is not an earthly kingdom. It's not a political kingdom. Jesus doesn't appear on any paper ballots. Jesus appears on the ballot of your heart. He still offers good news for poor people like us. See, it's only the poor in spirit who recognize their spiritual scarcity and then turn to Jesus in faith. Jesus still heals suffering. See, the physical healing that Jesus offered by miracles only lasts for a matter of years. Spiritual healing lasts for eternity. Jesus is still in the business of freeing hostages. See, we're all born as slaves to sin. We're all born prisoners to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus offers us forgiveness, redemption, and freedom. Jesus still cures blindness. This is proven by those whose vision he physically restored in the gospel accounts. But in addition to physical blindness, more importantly, he heals spiritual blindness. The ones walking in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus also ends oppression. You know, though we see that oppression still continues in this world, though people are still held back in life because of their nationality or their gender or their race, Jesus offers escape from this world system. Once we become God's sons and daughters, Satan's oppressive rule is conquered. We no longer have to live under his evil regime. We are free to obey our Heavenly Father. Jesus is our King. Jesus is still in the business of creating fresh starts. All who are in Christ are new creatures. The old has passed away. The new has come. The kingdom that Jesus offers is an eternal kingdom. If you receive him, you receive a new life. You receive spiritual healing. You receive spiritual vision. You receive freedom from your sin and freedom from guilt. And the good news is this. Our Messiah has come. But what about now, you might ask? There is still poverty and oppression and suffering and blindness in our world. What does Jesus do for us today? You know, as long as the people of this world, like the people of Nazareth, refuse to receive their king, as long as they look beyond him for something different, they will continue to walk in darkness. They will continue to be ruled by the prince of this world. They will serve sin all of the days of their life. And the outcome of such a life 
will always be poverty and oppression and suffering. There simply is no peace apart from the kingdom of God. But now, as citizens of God's kingdom in this world, we should do everything that we can to stem the tide of poverty and suffering and oppression. And in doing so, we should hold forth the truth of the gospel so others might enter God's kingdom. When we feed the hungry, we meet their physical need. When we speak up for those held back by race or any other issue, we meet their need for justice. When we work to deliver the victims of human trafficking, we meet their need for freedom. When we provide humanitarian aid and medical assistance to refugee camps, we meet their need for dignity. As citizens of the kingdom of God, these are the right things to do, to demonstrate the compassion of Christ, to show the kingdom of the world what the kingdom of God is all about. But make no mistake, eternal deliverance only comes when we preach the good news of Jesus Christ and when by faith in him, People enter God's kingdom. When we share the gospel, we meet their ultimate need for a savior. And one day, the kingdom of God will be the last kingdom standing. All other kings will bow in either worship or defeat. When Frederick Handel wrote the Messiah, he chose to quote scripture. And I'll close with those words. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. and I pray, Lord, that we would be good subjects, good citizens of the kingdom of God, we, as those who have trusted in Jesus Christ, who are now ruled by him, Father, that we would act in this world to show the kingdoms of this world what the kingdom of God is all about. But Father, in doing so, may we hold forth the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, just as our Savior Jesus came to bring good news. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would be ambassadors of that same good news, that others might know who you are, that others might enter your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.